Welcome back to Sociology. You made it through the first week. Congratulations. Um, some people have already taken the test and have done very well. Um, I made the first test short because of the issue of people adding the course late. Um, the next tests will all have 30 questions rather than 15. And so, um, but the points will be the same. It's all 15 points. It just becomes 30 questions now that everybody's enrolled and up with everything. Okay, um, in this lecture, I'm going to give you a quick summary of Chapter 4, which is about two things, one on the macro side and one on the micro side. And you will be really prepared for this by your reading on theory. And it'll help if you go back and look at those theory lectures if you start to feel kind of like, what's going on in this chapter? Um, because that's your background. That's your building block. Okay, so on the macro side, we've got social structure, very abstract concept. You can't see it anywhere, like you can see a building. It's not, it's an abstract concept that describes the way society works. And these patterns are repeated. Remember we talked about institutions being patterned behaviors and functionalism? Like your high school is still there, even functioning the same way that it was, even though you're not there anymore. It has a life of its own. That's what social structure is very similar of a concept. That our actions, the way we do things, our behaviors are patterned by larger social forces, by culture, by norms, um, by everything that we learned in our socialization. Um, and so social structure is on the macro side and we'll be looking at that um, second. Now, the first set of things that I want to look at are more on the micro side, the, the interpersonal side, and that is uh, some interaction, interaction, and we'll talk about uh, uh, dramaturgy and some, some more advanced concepts in symbolic interactionism. And again, if you start to feel kind of lost, in this discussion, go back to that uh, PowerPoint that I put up with symbolic interactionism. Okay, now the lectures aren't a substitute for the book. They're meant to go with the book, so be sure you read the book because there's stuff and look at the notes and everything because stuff will be pulled for the tests off of all of that. Um, okay, so let's start off kind of on the macro so with status. We're all familiar with status symbols. You know, everybody knows that, you know, a Rolls Royce, um, you'll have to pardon the kids playing in the background. I hope you can't hear them from the microphone. <laughs> um, a Rolls Royce um, is a status symbol. It shows how much money you have. You have, or you have the profession or the ability or the social background where you inherited enough wealth to be able to drive that around. It's a status symbol. Expensive jewelry is a status symbol. It's meant to communicate something. So you're all familiar with status in that way. But let's look at it in the sociological way. A status is sort of a social position that you occupy. So if you're on a football team, you're either your uh, position, you're... I, actually, I love hockey. So <laughs> let me di diverge a minute. Um, your left wing, your center, or your right wing or you're the coach, or you're the goalie. Um, that also kind of works for soccer, I guess. Um, and all of those are statuses. So being team captain is a status. Um, to go back to football, being a running back is a status. It's a position that you occupy. And statuses can be, have both positive and negative associations to them. But it's something that you do within a structure. So in football or hockey, the structure is the team. In society, the structure will be the different uh, institutions that you're dealing with. So in your status as a student, you're going to be doing things within the uh, institution of education, within the structure of education. You know what to do. You know, there's a pattern to things that are expected of students. You do the reading, um, you explore different things that interest you, you do homework, you try to get some fun in with your friends and family, um, you take tests, learn more, go forward 
and graduate. Um, so you know that's the structure. So the structure is very abstract. You can't point to any one thing. The structure is whatever the structure is, whether it's the structure for education, whether it's the structure of a football team or of a kitchen. You can think of uh, kitchens as having social structure. You've got the chef who has a stat who has a status. He's the chef. He has certain responsibilities attached to that position. Um, you have the sous chef. That's the guy that in a diner you would call him a prep cook. But if you're in a fancy restaurant, you call him a sous chef. It's French. Fun. Um, and he preps the food for the chef. The chef is more like a manager. And then you have the dishwasher and the waiters, waitresses, servers, I guess they're also called. And so restaurant manager, all of those are statuses within the structure of the restaurant. The structure of a restaurant or a set of restaurants you can think of as kitchens. In fact, if you're interested in the sociology of food and symbolic interactionism, there's a great book. Um, I'm sure it's available as an ebook or used on Amazon pretty cheap by Gary Allen Fine called Kitchens. And it's about his, he wrote a book about the complex social structure that he observed while working in a restaurant kitchen. It's an awesome book great piece of sociology. Okay, so back to the subject. So a status is a position that someone occupies. This can be a profession like a judge uh, or a teacher or a um, fast food worker or an accountant or whatever. That's a status. So status can be occupation. Status can also be something like mother, uh, brother, sister, neighbor, those are statuses too. And you can see as you occupy different positions in different social contexts, you're going to change how you behave. For example, a working mother will not act the same towards her children in her role of mother as she will when she is at work with her co-workers. Um, statuses have roles attached to them, okay? So first, the first important term you've got is status. The second important term is a role, which is like a performance that you perform. You play a role. So the role are the expected behaviors for the status. Two separate things. Status, the position. Role, what you're supposed to do in that position. The role you play. Two different things. So don't mix them up. Okay, um, to recap, we've got our status and our role. We'll attach to statuses, we also get prestige. Prestige is not always symmetrical. I'll like, explain what I mean by that. Um, prestige statuses can have high or low prestige, which means that people in society may view them as better or worse than whatever standard they have. For example, some people may consider an astronaut to have more prestige than a surgeon. Um, or, depending on your social location, you may think a great chef has better uh, prestige than an astronaut. So it depends on where you are socially located, what your values are, what's your culture, that's going to play in to the prestige or lack of prestige that gets attached to a status. So our key terms are status, role, and prestige. So a status is a position, a role is what you do. A role, remember you play a role. And prestige, you can have either high or low prestige. And this is what I meant by a symmetrical, they don't always match. Um, a classic example, are teachers, um, teachers, professors, um, and uh, actually uh, police officers, is that their status in the community is high. They're, they tend to be respected in the community, but their pay tends to be low. It doesn't match the status. The pay doesn't match the status. So a basketball player makes more money than a teacher. <laughs> Um, or a policeman, you know, or most of us. 
But this is what I meant by it's not always symmetrical. If you can have a job that's high status, but it doesn't mean that it's high paying. So some plumbers who are blue collar make more money than some clerks who are white collar, some administrative people who are white collar. So white collar workers do not always make more than blue collar workers. It's not always symmetrical. That's the reverse example of low prestige having a high salary with the plumber. Um, plumbers are very valuable if anyone in your family is a plumber. <laughs> but sociologically speaking, that's what I mean. Okay. Now, another wrinkle on status is that we all have a master status that we kind of strategically empl employ depending on the situation. So let's say you're a teenager, you're in you're a freshman in college, you know, you've got your job, you just got your first job, say as a server in a restaurant, and someone walks in um, who is attractive to you and they're around your age and you kind of like to catch their eye. Well, at that moment, your master status changes from restaurant server to whatever your gender is, male or female, and the context for you changes from work to, can I get this person interested in me? Um, and so your master status of your gender takes over, or of your sexual preference, whatever that may be, takes over and the, the whole thing changes. And then when your boss walks up behind you while you're trying to flirt with the person, then all of a sudden, real quick, your master status changes back to worker, <laughs> back to server. And so your master status is whatever status that you are responding to and using the interaction, you're playing the role for that status at any given moment. So your master status can change. They call it a master status, but it can change depending on the situation that you're in. So, and you have lots of different statuses. You may be a parent, you may be a child, you may be a worker, a student, a neighbor, um, a customer, um, any number of positions that you are put into a number of statuses and sometimes they come into conflict. Um, now when you think about the behaviors that are attached to the statuses, think about this example. Working mother. Okay, so we've got two statuses that have roles attached to them and the roles conflict. Now if, you, if, if you're a mom, your role requires you to put your children first. And, and the culture requires that. If you are also working, your, your boss requires you to put work first. And you can see the conflict there. That's something that need, has to be negotiated, dealt with. That's called role conflict. And as a student, you can have the same thing. Maybe you have, uh, maybe you're on an athletic team and you also have a test coming up but there's a practice right when you need to study and you have to make a choice and your two roles are conflicting and you have to ask yourself, am I going to be a good athlete or am I going to be a good student? That's a role conflict, it's tough choices. The best way is to try and manage your time. Okay, so that's role conflict. Now I wanna talk just a little bit about the macro aspects of society. What holds society together? We have earliest, one of the earliest things we have is from sociologists called Tonys in 1887. These are German words, You'll, you can find them on the PowerPoint and, and in the book, um, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft means like a small town community, a small town community, a small town way of relating where your relationships to other people are determined by family and personal ties. Gesellschaft is more of a city situation where your relationships are governed by contracts. You're a worker, you're a renter, you know, 
your whole existence has to do with contacts, even though, of course, you'll have personal ties. But in a Gemeinschaft society, that's all you have. In a Gesellschaft society, important aspects of your, your work have to do with contractual obligations. Someone contracts you as a worker. Um, whereas work in Gemeinschaft, you work because you're on a family farm and that's what the family does. They work on the farm. Nobody signed a contract with you. Um, so those are the two different things that hold societies together. Um, Durkheim talked about it as mechanical and organic solidarity, but I'm not holding you responsible for that because it's essentially different words describing the same thing as Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, so it would be a repetition. But just know that it's been a theme. You know, remember back to the Industrial Revolution, they were trying to explain why during all of this chaos society was holding together, this is what they came up with, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Okay. Now, there's kind of a subset of more advanced symbolic interactionism that uh, comes into play with dramaturgy, ethnomethodology, and the social construction of reality. Dramaturgy is Irving Goffman's view of the world, which said that we carry forward this metaphor of roles. Everybody's playing a role. The situation you're in is like a play. You have props to perform your role. Um, and you can look at life, you can analyze it as a drama. What is the role of all of the players? So it's a perspective on looking at individual and small group interactions. Um, if you're a gamer, you would really be into this. Um, the second concept, um, also in your book, Ethnomethodology, is breaking the norm to find out what the norm is. This is like our example back in week one, where I said, try getting in an elevator and facing the back, which is against the norm. Ethnomethodology is a whole set of that. Eth ethno <laughs> Kids are playing, sorry. Ethnomethodology is a whole set of techniques that have you break the norms so that you can discover the norms. And if you're in a foreign country, I know a lot of you are, um, you know, deployed or stationed or living abroad. Um, I'm sure you can share examples of when you discovered what you were doing wrong by doing it wrong and having someone correct you. Well, ethnomethodology takes that and makes it into an entire research method. You do things wrong on purpose. Because society, our own society, can be so invisible to us. We're like fish in water. We don't see what's going on. But if you, so sometimes it's hard to see what the social rules are. They're so subtle. They're so abstract. They're so ingrained. But if you do something wrong, people around you let you know real quick that that was the wrong thing to do. And you experience it when you go into a foreign culture, culture that is foreign to you, but not so much in your own. Well, ethnomethodology is a set of research methods for breaking the norm in order to find out the rules in your own society to, to help you see your own society more clearly. Um, Goffman, um, he was a professor at UCLA and it was, he, he worked in the late 50s, um, early 60s, he was doing these, having his graduate students do these experiments and one day he assigned them to go home like everything was normal for dinner with their families but not use any utensils and offer no explanation as to why they were eating with their fingers. <laughs> um, now in some cultures you're supposed to eat in your fingers but in Los Angeles you use a fork. <laughs> um, so they, re they were supposed to remember what happened, record and report on it the next day. And it's very interesting, they discovered the ways that people handle an, a break of the norm. And, and they discovered that there was a pattern to the reaction. Um, the first pattern was joking. You know, the people would react as if they thought the student was playing a joke by eating with their hands. Um, the second reaction, it took a long time for the family to get to the point of saying, is something wrong with you? Are you okay? <laughs> it, it's interesting that that wasn't the first reaction. 
And so that's an example of a professor giving an assignment in ethnomethodology and having the students go out and discover the pattern that, of behaviors that emerged when they all came together, they all found out that they experienced pretty much the same thing. Um, that first, they, their parents and family thought they were joking, um, and then as time went on, took it more and more seriously. Well, could you have discovered that role really without doing that research? So that's ethnomethodology, a real, real life example. Okay, now here's the most slippery one. Um, remember I said sociology is an abstract way of thinking. Well, it is, and the social construction of reality means pretty much what I put in the symbolic interactionism PowerPoints from last week. We construct reality through interaction with others using symbols. And what's real for you or your interpretation of the situation is not necessarily what's real for someone else. They may be interpreting it differently. Um, and so we actually construct what we think reality is, what we think is going on by reacting to one another. You know, what do you think if you see somebody running down the street, running down your street, running really fast down your street? How do you interpret that? What's your reality? You can leave a comment and tell me how you would interpret that. Um, and then I'll leave comments giving you um, the, the end of the story, so to speak. So picture this, you're at your window and you see somebody tearing down the street, running as fast as they can. What's the first thing that you think? Put it in the comments and then I'll come in after uh, I've given people a chance to do this. Um, I'll come in and give you the end of that story. Okay, so have a great afternoon and I will see you in week two.